So yeah, welcome everybody to, to uh, our webinar today. Uh, title, the topic is uh, from community space to system change. And uh, we have we have Imikar uh, featured today uh, with us. Uh, Imi, is, um, Imi is working for this organization called um, uh, uh, Impact Hub Birmingham. It was funded in 2015 uh, by a crowdfunding campaign. And it has really, really, um, done some interesting work since then in, in becoming some kind of community platform for, for place space change. But uh, before we uh, we head into what Imi is going to be telling us, maybe uh, for our international listeners and participants, I'll tell a little bit about Citra. So Citra is a Finnish innovation fund, and it, we, it, we call it nowadays a future fund, which is a shaper for the Finnish society. So uh, the, the Citra was Founded back in 1967 by the Finnish Parliament, who who uh, gave some some uh, funding for Citra as as a, a um, part of the Finnish Finland independ independence, and uh, we, our role in the Finnish society has changed a lot over the years. But nowadays we are a future future oriented organization that that uh, has the task of building some kind of successful Finland of tomorrow. And uh, Citra's future oriented work works on uh, five different areas. So um, we, we're doing some a lot of work in foresight and futures, a few projects over there. Then we're doing a lot of work in carb, carb, uh, building a carbon neutral circular economy. Uh, we're building Finland's capacity for renewal. And we have this uh, new working life and, and sustainable ec uh, economy area. And uh, Citra Lab is positioned in our societal training area. So. So we're building society's uh, capabilities uh, in, in dealing with different type of issues. And in our uh, training, training uh, theme, uh, we, we seek to bring together different type of change makers, both, both um, locally and also internationally to collaborate uh, and, and in, the, in, in the building of the successful Finland of tomorrow. And Citra Lab is our uh, new initiative. It's a place for everybody who wants to solve some kind of wicked problems and participate in, in building soci societal change. And the first Citra Lab is starting this has started this year and will be will be tackling the, the uh, inequality among among youth and children. And uh, basically, uh, Citra Lab is also like a, communities are very central to Citra Lab. So we have two two types of communities that we support. The first one is this type of change makers community. It's an open community that, that seeks to bring together people who are who are learning to tackle wicked problems together. And this webinar is part of this change makers community efforts. And we also have a futures laboratory we call, that, that deals with futures and learning uh, with a cross cross sectoral group of about 50 people and uh, excuse me, 30 people. And uh, this group is tackling social inequality among children, young people this year. So, so EB is relevant from both of these perspectives that we're, we're dealing with this year. And um, one, one thing that in Citra we're talking about a lot is that we're maybe seeing this type of fundamental shift uh, in the relationship between um, the citizen society, the, the, that's the yellow circle in this picture, and, and the, our old institutions, that is the black, black, um, black uh, triangle here. So, so traditionally, the old model has been that the black triangle, the institutions have, have uh, operated a society for the people. But uh, since the rise of internet mobility, border, borderlessness and different types of speeds, we're having, we're having a constant tension in which like uh, the citizen society can uh, organize itself uh, pretty, pretty well. And um, we're, we're trying to find, and, and find new ways of uh, bringing those, these two worlds together. And uh, in Citra, we talk about a lot about participation, phenomenality, transparency and sustainability. And we try to use these perspectives to uh, bring a new type of, uh, build, build this uh, new type of model where uh, power is with the people and uh, where institutions are working together with the citizen societies, with companies and different, different, part, different other parties to uh, build the society to get together. And uh, Sal, do you want to say yeah. something? Hey everyone, uh, if you want to add something in this discussion and if you have some questions, please write them down in the chat because uh, you have possibility to ask them or actually I can read them out loud half past nine. So 
please do that. Yes. And uh, since, since participation is at the heart of what, what we do at Sitka Lab, um, we'd like to hear, hear from all of you. So just a very short introduction into who you are and uh, where you're coming from. Who would like to start? You can uh, introduce yourself either, either uh, verbally by, by uh, putting on your microphone and video or, or then you can you can uh, introduce yourself in the group, uh, Zoom group chat. So do we have any starters? Um, I can start. Uh, I can't seem to figure out how to turn on my video, but perhaps it's not so important. Oh no, there you go. Uh, okay. Yes, we can see you. Great. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Helene Martin and I am a design researcher, systems thinker, uh, currently working at Demos Helsinki, um, which has the mandate of uh, bringing a more sustainable and democratic uh, future to the present. So that's shortly about me. Welcome, Helen. Who wants to go next? I can go. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Sara Kuluvainen and I work at Fingo. So Fingo is an uh, umbrella organization of uh, 300 uh, Finnish NGOs working with uh, development cooperation. And I work as an expert in innovation and development. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sala. And who wants to go next? I can continue because uh, well, I'm, it's easy after Sala, so I'm also Sala. And I'm working here in Citra Lab uh, with, um, uh, here with Citra Lab with Mikael, and uh, we're working with this wider community around, um, well, yeah, in Citra Lab. Great, thanks, Sala. Do, do we have somebody who wants to go next? Um, I can go if you hear me. Yes, we can hear. Okay, I I don't have my um, camera on, sorry, but I'm Rosa. I'm a um, geography student from University of Turku and I just joined because I saw um, an ad for this on Twitter and I found it interesting because I'm studying um, um, innovations of geog uh, geographies of innovation and transformative innovation and I found this very interesting and like relevant to my uh, master's thesis. So hello everyone. Awesome, welcome Rosa from, from Turku. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have Wayne, Wayne uh, commented on the chat that uh, he's Wayne from London, England. He's been working for the participatory city on bringing a new model of participation to Barking and Dagenham, uh, a, a deprived London borough. And he's in a noisy place, so he's going to have his mic off. Do we still have somebody who wants to introduce themselves? Hello, Thomas here. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my my cam on because I'm eating lunch at the moment, so I don't want you to see me eat. But uh, I've been interested in Sitra Lab since it began and been participating few of the events earlier, this is the first webinar that I'm attending. Uh, I'm a drama instructor by my uh, profession and been working within the field of uh, youth work for five years or for eight years now. And uh, at the moment I know I'm on my study leave and uh, building up uh, my own company that evolves participation and such things. So uh, this is really interesting for me from those those kind of points of view. Awesome. Welcome, welcome to us. And do we still have somebody who, who wants to introduce themselves? So I guess not. So uh, I just noticed that I haven't introduced myself either. So Salah, so like my colleague Sala just said, um, I'm Mikael Seppel. I work for the uh, Finnish Innovation Fund Citra and uh, I'm working at the Citra Lab as, as a community and participation and, and networks expert. So uh, I'm, I'm creating opportunities for different type of people to uh, learn from what we're doing within the lab with our futures laboratory and also like le learn about cool people like Imi that who we have online today uh, from from abroad and, and 
get some get uh, build some kind of shared understanding of how we might uh, tackle wicked problems together. But uh, I think it's it's time for us to uh, let Imi speak. So Imi, would you like to maybe introduce yourself? And, uh... oh, we have one more introduction. Oh, okay. Here. Yes, uh, I can do it out loud. So hello, I am uh, I currently studying in the MA Service Design in London. I worked in community development after disaster in Japan, and I'm interested uh, in community engagement for my major project. Welcome from London. Okay. And so now, now we can let Amy, yeah. Amy go forward. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me this morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. So um, I've got about 20 minutes, um, and so I'm going to jump straight in and make the introduction as part of the beginning of my presentation, because um, I have a feeling that there'll be a lot of questions around lots of the things that I uh, bring up. So, I mean, I guess the first thing that I really want to share before I um, put my screen on, uh, let me just check this works. Um, yep, okay. So, um, so the most important thing I kind of want to share first to start off with is that this, there is no right answers on this work. And so I want to kind of take you on a little bit of a journey of why we have designed and grown the work that we've done in the way that we have and what are the kind of main things that we've been working on. Um, and then I'm going to move into showing you a, a live example of a significant piece of work that we've been doing in the children and young people space um, and how we kind of uh, grew a lab um, full of uh, citizens and artists and entrepreneurs and systems thinkers and all sorts of different people and how we've been organizing around that and I'm going to try and take you through that journey in this talk so that then when we have questions and answers we can have a little bit of kind of chat about some specifics that people want to know so um, the 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 talk title is a is a really good one actually and i'm really glad that citra um told it this because this was exactly the kind of um ex experimental journey that we wanted to go on nearly um how many years ago now about seven years ago so um i am part of an organization that's called uh oh, sorry it's in the wrong order zero zero and zero zero is a a, a studio of a collaborative studio of all sorts of different people from designers, programmers, social scientists, economists, architects. And about 15 years ago, it started um, when uh, a couple of co-founders, Indy and David, left um, the architecture practice in a in the more traditional way and set up zero zero with this idea that there was a more systemic more democratic way in which we would design our cities and our places and the work that we would do and that was the very early exploration they they went on when i am um, first met um these guys back in 2011 2012 we were convening quite significantly around um sorry let me get Get back to the right place we were con convening quite significantly in birmingham it was pretty simple we were doing things like tedx's um what we had we started with two or three people in a coffee shop to um, last year two thousand people at the hippodrome um, and i was quite intentional i mean tedx isn't the most revolutionary platform but you know eight seven eight years ago um they certainly weren't inviting challenging ideas onto the platform and we were really taking the local um uh, platform and, and bringing ideas around race and gender and systems and power onto the stage and we were giving um, at that time we genuinely would say it was giving citizens voice and I, I hate that language now and I'll tell you why shortly but we were getting people up onto those stages now one really important thing it, people often ask me and you will see later like how have you gone from a couple of people and basically being a bunch of kids because I'm, I'm still quite young and, and organizing yourselves in this way um, and I think one of the really really key key factors in our city is that we have a real chasm a real gap of leadership um, in from from the demographic that actually live in that city um, there has been central government reports on the city uh, around the leadership being quite patriarchal very paternal very top down the council and local government is very big and the reason why I say this is because I think this allowed citizen-led activity to flourish in a different way 
it didn't flourish out of abundance. It actually flourished out of real scarcity, real challenge, uh, and a real space for citizens to come in and start to organize themselves in a different way. It wasn't really an invitation um, to, you know, or, or a bunch of funding or, hey, come and do this. Um, there's all this money or this city really wants this. In theory, they want it, but the, the truth of how the city is organized is not has not been the, the case. And I think that's one of the reasons why we go on to to tell you a bit more about what what happened with the hub so um you might be thinking impact hub uh cool yeah i know impact hubs all over the world i know what they're like um well i think one of the the key things to say and a lot of people comment on this is that we in birmingham are quite different from the rest of the network and this comes from from that early relationship with zero zero back in 2011 when um we were convening with tedx people started to ask us you know what's next um how do we take this from uh, events and community movement into some into a more formal platform where we can actually make things happen and spaces weren't weren't the only uh, thing that came up we definitely didn't start with the question of you know what does a space need to look like we were really tapping into the dreams and wishes and challenges of the citizens of of this movement and, and really talking about what do you want in the future in the city? How do you want to be involved? So we didn't start with space and that, that is again another really key part of why I think we have been um, organizing in the way we have. Um, and at that time, uh, the, the Impact Hub network was going through a, a, a range of different changes and um, Indy who I work with was I'm saying, you know, Birmingham could really be a, a sort of prototype of what the future of the Impact Hub network could be. You could really start to look at what this town hall of the future, the places where citizens convene, uh, where systems of people come together, you galvanise around wicked challenges. And at that time, the, part of the theory of change is really to look at how a global platform like Impact Hub would start to shift. Um, so that's why we we went into it. We went into it really knowing the systemic challenges, which I can talk about in an, in another talk or with people uh, separately about the business model, about the type of things that that um, that were problematic within the hub network and what we needed to really work on to to take that forward. So that's why we are a hub. You might be wondering like how on earth is being an impact hub linked to all this other stuff that you are doing um and then you guys will know this one pretty well but this is the um cabinet office um obesity system map that was done in about 2011 in the uk and i think this was my and i want to tell you the first, the sort of personal journey on this this was my first real um look into understanding that problems when i was quite young that problems like uh, obesity are massive system challenges of which you guys know really well but what the question i asked myself quite significantly is how do we then organize communities and platforms and spaces and movements to be able to not solve this challenge because this is not going to be solved by citizens alone but to be able to constantly think design um, and reflect in this space and that was the biggest challenge we asked ourselves as a platform even as a space what, what would this look like um, and so the impact of I'll move through this because we don't have time um, was crowdfunded that was a really really big part of what I think has led to the, the culture of how we work people invested in the platform they continue it they physically build it you can see behind me uh, everything is 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 made by the community and i think there's a real sense of shared ownership over this platform and over the years impact to birmingham as a brand has really tried to just move into the background and become less and less relevant and the actual work to take forefront um because one of the key things that we saw within the network is that the, in this work and this desire to do system change work people get lost in the platform and the brand of their own space and forget about the work so what we went went on from there that looks at is an average day at the hub and i've just put that in for you so you can see what what does it look like who's there what are we doing um and and the way we started to organize for this is looking at the role we had in in people and convening people and bringing people together from all different backgrounds the use of space 
how that works and then what we started to coin is these open movements and this is this was really an experiment and it was based on this idea that we know the premise that we've all been talking about since back since Marco Steinberg and everyone started all of this work you know Marco for us was a real inspiration and actually one of the things I've said to Marco quite often about the Helsinki Design Lab is I loved what Helsinki Design Lab did it was almost before its time. But one of the things I asked myself when I used to see the Helsinki Design Lab work is how could more everyday people be part of that process? You know, how could that be? What he's done at quite a high level with quite a lot of um, um, uh, deep and very early thinking, what could that look like if that's how our spaces were designed all the time? And that's what started in this open movements um, piece of work. We didn't know what was going to happen, but what I knew is that very, very quickly, our spaces, the things that we were doing, needed to be able to organize quickly around challenges, sophisticatedly, needs to be able to bring the people it did together and disband them whenever, whenever that was the case. So, for example, you know, we knew we couldn't build a big, expensive, heavy lab team that full time worked on this stuff because there wasn't the money for that kind of thing. But we needed to be able to learn from the work of Helsinki Design Lab and others to to organize in a sophisticated way. So over the years, it's developed into this is what we sort of talk about as the sort of tagline for um, Impact Hub Birmingham is the home of a movement for a fairer, um, more open, uh, more uh, Sorry, one second. I've just lost my screen. Just come off a second. Yeah. So, the, so this movement for a, a, a fairer, more just Birmingham was right at the forefront. You you see this much more than you'll ever see the Impact Hub brand or any of us. And this was really important for us, which was that everything else was just in service of this broader mission. And how that played out was that we have a range of open movements now, of which I'm going to talk about radical childcare today. Um, for the last sort of 10 minutes of, of the talk because that's, that is a very, very specific piece of work that really taps into the methodologies around um, lots of the Helsinki Design Lab work. Marco actually was one of the advisors on that work. Um, the, 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 the use of community space, experimentation, citizens. Where, However, what's really important is that um, I wanted to show you this slide is because we have other open movement work which is, is similar. Now, and to tell you very quickly about it, Demo Dev is about is a, a movement around um, housing. We have a massive housing crisis, as as people will know, and it's a, a piece of work around data, citizens, self build, community build, small sites, and really looking at how citizen developers can be a key part of the the, the housing crisis. Um, and then we have creative resistance, which is uh, again around artists who are working on the fault line of um, of gentrifying cities of um of the space between uh city design and and how cities are built and grown and how artists have a key role in that and what i want to really be really clear on as we go into radical childcare which we'll do in a lot more detail now is that there is not one methodology for these different open movements. They don't follow the same lab process. They don't go through the same eight week this, four week that. They, they don't have all of the same, same theories of change. And I think one of the biggest problems I've seen in this space is that lots of people over the years when I've been working in space have been looking for a method that will just work. And yes, there are absolutely key principles, uh, and I'll talk about them in the radical childcare piece that work across all of these. But each one of these needs different types of leadership, different types of context, different skills. Understanding the stack around the housing system is very, very different to unleashing the creativity of artists to start imagining diff different futures in a systemic way. The, the radical childcare work is full of all sorts of brilliant things which we'll talk about, but all sorts of complexity around working with children that is very different to, to Demo Dev. They have key theory of change principles across them and key things that we do, but what I'm not going to talk about is a cookie cutter way of just saying implement this in your city and then it will work. And all of them are really contextual and have leaders that um, that have grown through the city. So in Demo Dev, we have leaders in housing and data and, and making and community build and uh, cooperative futures and shared ownership. 
and in creative resistance we have really radical really brilliant artists these these um leaders have grown up through the movement and then and then grow them and lead them and that's really important again before i go on it doesn't mean that do, replicating this work is impossible it just means that we shouldn't be looking for easy answers that are short term that can jump into places and jump out if you want to do this kind of work because we've been we are of Birmingham and we've been living here for the back living here for the last 10 years and, and plan to uh, God willing with, with, you know, for, for a long time to embed this work. And I think it's one of the key things that I'm interested in is what does it, what do we have to do to make it cool again, to invest in a place, to not be constantly looking for exits and to really understand what it means to do that over the long term. Or if we cannot do that ourselves because we are not set up for that, how do we invest in people to be able to have that sort of um, vision over a place? And that comes from, again, the final sort of personal part for me is that all of the hub and all of this work that we've done really taps into a deep cultural past for many of our of our founders and many of our team we are all from large um l largely um communities asian and black communities that ha work interdependently over many many generations in a very natural way who have all had you know elders and wisdom from people that have stayed in our communities and and helped us navigate so many complexities and we've really tried to strip back a lot of the innovation language and go back to what we know and that's why the hub functions almost as a quite a, a big sort of family and community space so we've really tried to strip out a lot of the in innovation stuff from it but but take the tools and take a lot of that what we know to, to go deeper so radical childcare um uh, make sure you give me a warning when we're a couple of minutes away Miguel. um so so radical childcare started again if you look at the picture on the left um what don't worry about the language too much on the right it started as one of our team members six five years ago um being pregnant while the hub was setting up and coming back to work and figuring out that childcare was expensive and inflexible and poor quality and hard to access and needed massive deposits and was very very um much a uh, not a choice just something that you had to had to do and the way you had to do it was very rigid and and I'm sharing that because it did very much start from quite an impressive leader in our community just saying, hey, like, this is really problematic. We need to do something. Um, so within a couple of weeks of the hub opening, we set up what you can see on the left, which is this, um, this creche. It was a creche upstairs while parents worked downstairs. And that was set up within a couple of weeks. We started off with a stay and play. A couple of weeks later, it turned into a creche. About six months later, it turned into a children's membership. Um, the agility of the, com the community and the founding team at the hub meant we could do something like that very quickly. It was an investment. It was, we don't make money from it, but suddenly the hub community's um, natural day-to-day -day organizing and living as an intergenerational community started to come to play. And this is really important because actually we don't, it's not this far away concept that we go to somewhere and perform some labs on people or do stuff. It is actually the way the space works um, instead of wondering about how current members would deal with children we we very much just told them this is how things are going to be and people adjusted around that so even just the cultural small early start to radical childcare was about living and practicing that on site um, but then very very quickly as you start to um, unpack childcare and you start to look at what are the issues, you realize that we are dealing with um, a, a messy, complex, knotty, uh, problematic, unfair, biased, unjust, <laughs> uh, sexist system that is just uh, creating challenges at every corner. And it didn't take long at the end of these stay and plays and crash sessions when you started to ask other parents what was going on for this kind of absolute outpour of, of challenge and frustration to come through you talk to people without children and they're talking about how difficult it was in their workplaces as a, as a manager as and so we really quickly realized uh, this has got to be something more and um, there's no way that that we can just leave it here as a, a small experimental intervention to help our own members we need to go into this more deeply now if you think about where we were in the journey of this was nearly four years four or five years ago this is when we were starting out the hub and we were actually talking about how does the hub organize itself 
um, and organise for those system challenges. And so we decided to use radical childcare as a as a, a prototype for this. And so we've been, we're now two years into this, um, two and a half years into this uh, ongoing system lab uh, piece of work that we've done. And I'm just going to walk you through really quickly what, what it looked like. So after that crash, where we discovered that, and through social media and through everything else that we discovered, good Lord, like this is re a real problem and every everything you overturn every little bit that you look at just opens up this whole other world of challenge if you talk to a childcare practitioner about what was going on they'll start a whole new world of Ofsted and regulation and all the problems they were going through if you talk to a dad about paternal leave they would start telling you about and so very quickly as a team we started to to actually just map these things out and go and take a decision to um to actually start to explore this in a more um, specific way. So we work with Dark Matter Labs, which is uh, one of the um, uh, offshoots of Zero Zero led by Indy. Uh, I strongly recommend reading some of Indy's work. Um, and, and we started to actually think about what this would look like. And we, we then got in touch with Marco from, from uh, Helsinki Design Lab early days and said, Marco, look, we are basically have been super inspired by the work that you did and we've now built a platform where we think we could bring these two things together and start to build something quite impressive and so we had just a bunch of really advisory conversations and um and then started to do some mapping of everything we were hearing and and the reason why i'm, I'm really making this as simple as possible is because i think when you look at the production of radical childcare now it feels like how on earth do you ever get there but this is how it started we, um, the reason why it's hashtag radical childcare is we wanted to test out this idea that we need the hub to become a background. It doesn't need to be in the foreground. It can't be about the organization and radical childcare cannot feel like it's owned by just one, one person or one organization. People around the world need to be able to jump onto the hashtag and start participating and being part of it. And we've had really great examples of that, which I'll share at the end. And so um, we did uh, nearly two years worth of work. Um, we, prior to the lab, which I'm going to show you the website in a second, so you can start looking at, at what, what, what we were doing there. We had a whole range of um, uh, experiments going on at the same time. So one was to formalise the parent membership, and that was to look at what intergenerational spaces look like. Um, how they work, how parents, children, families, communities can exist together, can work together, can care and start to look at what the real opportunities were, but then also look at what the challenges were, because not everybody wants to be like next to their child uh, when they're working. So we were looking at all of these different spaces. Then a second part of our exper experimentation, which I'm not going to talk about too much today because it's, it's linked to something quite different, um, was investing in some local uh, leaders and incubating them in the city to look at what recreating some of this work looked like. So we worked in a place called Bearwood, which um, has areas of high wealth and really high deprivation to look at what does it actually mean to incubate and support a citizen to do this sort of work in their neighborhood. And that there's also a website for that, which I'll put into the comments later, which was a whole a thing called bearwood.cc. Um, and we did that at, at the same time. And, and then um, there were some other smaller experimental pieces. And then we did this system lab uh, work, which was um, over, it's been nearly nine, 19, 20 months now. And prior to what was the amalgamation of the event, we did um, a range of things. For example, we worked with uh, a range of families to do lots of research around mapping their daily lives and their, their weeks. And we spent many many hundreds of hours with um, families from across the region from all different backgrounds family setups um uh, races gender like gender different gender different sexuality different uh, relationship setups we um looked at um how they were living their lives and when we were with them we basically had lots and lots of tools which helped them to map their own lives to tell their own stories to tell us their we, we used to just sort of sit and listen and just have a cup of tea really and you would watch people start to go yeah and that happens because of this and that happened and they would mapping this in front of them so very very early on we were just sitting back and showing people that there's there's this complexity that they engage with 
all of the time in their everyday life and um, and so from there we we brought those into case studies we also did the same with a group of children um, which again in all of our resources all of this will be there so you can have a look at actually how this uh, works we looked at their lives we looked at how they traveled to school we looked at or nursery we looked at what excited them they had small cameras they documented their lives in these huge scrapbooks um, and we and, and we extrapolated backwards from there around the types of things um, how they were traveling the impact the air pollution all of these other things we took those backwards and we had conversations with them leading up into this um, into this uh, system lab work which I'll show you the website now um, so for this again we also uh, had a uh, uh, lots and lots of desk-based research for about six months so dark matter labs really led on that for us and um, and they uh, did a lot of the work in the background around um, and you can see that on this page which is the story of the lab which looked at all of the data which started to look at um, a lot of the the mapping of what was happening and there's lots of um, videos here and they produced a range of quite um, uh, brilliant resources which we then took We've got a couple of. By the way, you may easily not see the web page. No, I think you have your uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, okay, so one second. Share the web page. Okay, I'll share the website. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll just show you this first. So. In preparation for this couple of days lab, we had um, lots and lots of tools like this, uh, complex and simple, small cards, all of this stuff is available on the site with instructions about how they were used. And um, this was nearly six to nine months of desk based research going back and forth between our local team that was with families, that were finding the links, that were listening to all the mapping, and then a team that were also looking at the research and what, what, um, uh, what we know and bringing these together and there was three or four quite large diagrams that looked at all of the different factors mapping behind uh, dri hidden drivers behind childhood development um, around the, there's lots and lots of different pieces of, of work like this which we used as, as then as uh, resources so just tell me if you can see this screen um, and yeah okay so um, so now I'll go back to the front of the website so um, we had loads we had lots and lots of these this these maps and and it was quite interesting if you're thinking about if you work for a sort of a centralized lab team or something like that the role of the dark matter labs was really incredible they actually stayed in the background out of the community because they knew they weren't legitimate they knew that the, the work that they were doing on mapping all the systemic um, drivers and creating all these tools was complex and hard and time consuming and we needed to move quickly. And we knew that actually our skills lay working in the community, feeding back what we were hearing, having regular huddles with, at, with the DML team to then put that into into tools and to design together and to influence the language to make sure that it didn't sound um you know too far away from everything and i think look i'm i don't know if this is controversial but i think it works really really well i'm actually quite you know over the years we've worked very closely with dml and one of the things that we have learned particularly working with indy and a range of other people is that it, half spending half our time trying to find ways in which people who work in these ways can like be in in a community that they don't know is uh, for me pointless work so what I think is quite interesting and and it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of money and a lot of energy is that we are quite locally embedded and we have really good relationships with teams that have specific and and really really high quality skills and we absolutely have to feed back what's going because they need to hear what's what we're hearing but trying to do that work with strangers in communities where people don't necessarily trust or understand why people are there is is really really what worked for us so we kept that revolving loop going um, and so this desk-based research research out in the city with families and all the practice of working locally in Bearwood working at the hub led to this three day first version of this that we did. We spent about three months recruiting. We had an open application process um, and we got like a lot of applications. And what was really interesting is it was everything from people working in probation services, single parents, families that we'd worked with, people from the parent membership, all the way to the head of the children's trust, people from big funders, um, uh, 
people working in quite high power in social services in nurseries so very very naturally because of the long deep embedded way of working and the, the art the, you know all of the other programming that we've brought around radical childcare, which again you can see on the website links which i'll put in the chat um led to this really natural uh, application um uh, application of, of people who came now we did an application process because we wanted to actually make sure that people were engaging for the for the right reasons at this point but I think in the future I'd probably do it in a range of different open open ways so we had about 40 people over three days we took them through a range of um, activity um, where we presented lots of the research we worked through um, lots of ideas we talked a lot about the interconnected nature of problems and the thing that I just want to say from this because I could talk about this forever is is there is absolutely no doubt in my mind unequivocally that people uh, of all different backgrounds ranges abilities iqs whatever can deal with can, this this sort of work it is not at all that it's for something that is just left for people like me or for people designers and other all that's required is great facilitation great tools and just shifting the language because actually system mapping and mapping the challenges and looking at the opportunities is them actually navigating their everyday lives the role that we did play was then overlay the sort of systemic threats that society is facing so we then said okay this is great we want all of these things but what about you know air pollution and climate breakdown and all so people would then start to go okay it isn't just about me and what i want from a service it's about me and how i sit within the system and the opportunities and the the, the, the changes that we need to make uh, across here so you can start to see in this open picture there's there's tons of pictures like this where people started to map and look at ideas and come together in 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 more sophisticated ways so this took about two days in the process we did lots and lots of activities and i'll show you um you can uh, download them all in the in one of these sections there's a download link i'll send it in a second there's a whole story of the lab there's lots about the type of um, research and work we use, the vision, how our theory around how systemic investment can can happen. Um, there's lots in the research, which is where you can find all the tools. And then what we did was we took it a step further from from this. So we spent the third day asking this question. OK, so by the third day, the, the floor, the walls, everything were like bursting full of, you know, ideas challenges mapping of the problem all the tools that we'd do, uh, put together and tons of excitement and and um inspiration really interestingly normally what happens in these spaces is people feel really frustrated like this is way too complex how on earth are we going to do anything about it but actually by the third day there was a real kind of there's so much we can do about this so we then started to curate this into a range of different areas in which you would need to invest to, to create radical outcomes for children and families in um, in in this space. So instead of saying it's all about play, it's all about tech, it's all about services, it's all about new learning models, we brought together the different areas that people were saying, you know what, we need more of this, we need more of this, we need more of this. And in each one, I'll just show you one because I'm going to finish now. In each one, so for example, there was lots of talk about play. So in each investment area, we did, oh, there we go, we did a, a bit of thinking around why people were talking about that so importantly. So we had Pat Kane come and talk to us for a few days, who was the author behind um, the play ethic, and people really understood this in a particular way. So we, we put together then a bit of an idea around why we thought this was so important. And then we put together a range of different ideas in each section, there's normally two ideas that are big and bold. So, for example, the right to a play this play for life is about legislating play across the country. Um, children starting school at seven in the UK would be a total shift in what we're currently doing. Um, and then we started to talk about some ideas. So these would be big radical ideas that would change things. Then we started to put in a few ideas that we already know are happening in other places. Um, and it's just about implementing them. So it's not about needing to do some radical shift. We just need to take good ideas from other places and put them into our area. And then um, 
the, the third one was about more simple things, play, play finding, so playful wayfinding or putting metrics into your projects around the effects of play deprivation. And in each one, you can see that we've done this every single time. So when we heard that time poverty was a real issue, not just physical poverty, uh, financial poverty, um, then we started to talk about what does that look like? Again, big ideas. What if you had universal basic income? Whatever you think of that, something along those lines. You know, what about a year of paid parental leave? Again, ideas, second wave of ideas, ideas we already know are happening that we need to implement. And then some simple things. And these are just simple ideas that local communities can also do. Um, and so we did this in all of the different areas. And it was incredible because all of a sudden, when people then say, right, well, what do we then do with this complex system? You had your single mom saying, well, actually, you know what? My role is there's stuff I can do on my street. And uh, have you seen, you know, we've been talking about this and the head of the children's services is, is saying, you know what, I need to take these ideas back. And when people come back to you and say, well, your little children's membership or your little playful street is not going to overturn this complex, messy system. We actually just sit and say, yes, it isn't. But as a community, we have done the work to think about what would a bold investment across the sector a collaborative group of people working in all these different areas actually uh, look like in this in this space and we've got extremes from you know services and institutions that are very simple things all the way to like democratizing the the ability to dream again in a time where if you live in the uk or you know anything about the uk right now um, yeah, things aren't good, right? And we have a, are having a systemic eradication of the ability to think about the future and to actually hope for something better. So things like this were about having large, exciting ideas and then um, that were quite ethereal, as well as some quite practical services and institution ideas. So I'm just going to finish there and we can chat because a lot of the stuff on the website is all here for you. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can download, um, tons of videos, um, loads of the ethnographic research resources. It's all here. Um, and yeah, I just opened the conversation really. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. I didn't want to uh, distract you. No, not, <laughs> not, not at all. Not at any, any point because this was such, such cool stuff. But yeah, now, now would be the point uh, at which if somebody who is uh, listening online would like to ask something from Amy, uh, you might be able to do that. You can do it either by, by opening your mic or by writing it down in the chat. Yeah, we have one question here from Wayne. For the radical child care work, how did you navigate or overcome uh, the legislation and rules around child care and child protection in order to make things happen? Well, yeah, so, so we worked with a local um, child, a very well a well regarded local children's centre it meant we put some resource back into them as well because they're being depleted and eradicated right now in the UK um, and all I'm going to say around this is um, there is no shortcutting this work we had to have somebody working on this a lot of the time that's why the radical childcare work has been a lot slower than say our housing work or our work with artists because you can't shortcut um, if you want children at the middle in the middle of the work if you want them right at the core of designing and and growing and being in your building with you um you need to to do that so that's been slower it's it's mean we've worked with somebody who is a professional in this space and we have them on our advisory board and we kind of navigate that through um uh, every week and the challenges are all sorts of different things from you know uh, the food that we buy for the for the parent membership all the way to the kind of impact of um, uh, doing ethnographic research with children and ethics and boundaries and all of that so I mean Wayne I know that it's probably uh, nicer to have oh yeah we just did this and it was fine but it really isn't it's complex and, and messy messy work but actually I think being in the heart of understanding the child protection system Ofsted um, working with forcing yourself to have to work with um, children's centers and other places actually shows you uh, what things things are like in reality rather than sitting from afar and designing how you think um, those things can work and how people should work so it's been really great great for us but it's been hard work it also means we can now give great advice to people who we've been working with about how to do it um, and then there's some there's some lots of shortcuts that you can take around um, how you provide childcare on site um, so we've done some of that to ensure that we didn't have to be Ofsted registered 
Awesome, thanks. And what I really like uh, like about what you're speaking about is that you're you're putting the innovation methods on background. And you're talking about like collaboration with different type of type of parties and yeah. uh, uh, bringing like communities and facilitating uh, things in their own 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 words. I think that's really really interesting interesting yeah. approach to how how you're doing things. Yeah. We have another question here. Helen, where are the participants volunteers? And um, if so, how did you deal with continu continuity and sustained engagement? Um, okay, so so um, this again, and this isn't so much of a straightforward um, answer because radical childcare has become for for the last three four years now a movement of people doing lots of things things i haven't mentioned today including lots of artistic programming we we do all sorts of things in this space around children around play around the future and because it's based within the hub it also means that uh, within and around the hub that people also synonymously think about it as, with the hub so in the work where we took on professional uh, services or support we would pay where um, families needed um, a stipend to participate in the research we would pay and support that because we took we were spending a lot of time with them where people need need travel and other things we we subsidize and pay for that but one of the things that I think is very different about what we do compared to um, many people working in the system lab space is we have no like we have no challenge with engaging people because we're in the city, we're here all the time. People are often like queuing to want to be part of these processes. We have to turn people away from the system lab. And I think this is the key thing for us is when you're in a place for a long time, this boundary between volunteer, volunteers taking part in your program and actually a movement of citizens getting involved to improve the city. Um, because we don't talk about the impact and people know that this is not helping us to make more money. We're literally trying to organize ourselves to be a real force as a citizenry in the city. So the, the space between volunteers and people who just desperately wanna be part of this is quite narrow. Um, and also because we're very open with our pay and how and what resources we have. People know that actually our experiences are often very close to theirs or um, we're, we're um, uh, actually they're doing people like the Children's Trust, you know, doing a lot better than us and a lot more resource and they should definitely get get behind it. Um, again, having the hub also means that there's lots of things that we can offer to people where we have, say, run out of money or we can't, you know, fund something in the way that we really want to through services and resources that we have here. Um, but everywhere where people need money to participate, to uh, travel, to be part of research, we've always paid stipends. Um, but negotiating them is just very easy because people trust us as opposed to seeing us as some really big um, organization coming in to run a program or so something like that in their areas. Um, and regardless of what piece of work we ha have currently got money for or that we're working on in radical childcare, as a movement, it's quite permanent and it, 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 it's doing all sorts of different things. So for example, last two weeks ago, a big delegation from Scotland came down to learn from radical childcare um, and it, we, we respond to all the different things that people are looking to to do and be part of. So it's not like this, it ran between these dates and these dates and then the funding ran out and then we went, like it was over. Um, there has been funding for pieces of work where we've been able to be really focused, but we don't stop because the funding has run out. And one of the reasons is because our mission and our being based here is a lot more long term than um, just say a project or a business that's looking to like make as much money as possible in a short period of time. So, um, as, so in the three days, there were people who gave their time, but really happily gave their time. Um, and when we asked uh, certain people, do you want stipends? They were like, no, we've got jobs. We don't need stipends. Give those to parents, to families, to. Um, so we, we've fostered that culture of really trying to work um, beyond just this service relationship between us and somebody that we get work to do, uh, get to do work for us. That sounds really awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so one thing you mentioned uh, related to all of these three projects that, that you're running, running right now, that you're open, open movements, that you call them, is that they've, uh, they've grown leaders. And uh, could you elaborate on that, what you mean by 
yeah. by leaders. So, so how could you grow leaders or how could you enable leaders? That yeah. So, so um, this again came back to early in the Impact Hub um, journey. Uh, Indy outlined two or three big systemic challenges that mean that hubs basically don't become platforms for systems change. One of those was that you lose a lot of your co-founders and it's really simple. The reason why you do is that those co-founders come together with this big, bold, exciting vision for what they can do. They create a wave in their city. They start something. And then within six to 12 months, you realize the business model can't handle that many big uh, salaries. Um, these people are often headhunted. You lose them from your spaces. They go to work for other things. And then you're left with an operational space and uh, you have probably one space manager. And so one of the things that was really like at the front of my mind in starting the hub was how do you retain brilliant leaders who see their vision for the world, their challenges, the things they want to achieve, and this thing that can be very easily seen as an overhead of a space with printers to fix and other things, as how do they see this as the platform in which they can achieve that on? and how their work is amplified and more connected. And you have, you can do genuinely that old adage of you can do more together than you can do separately. It's linked back to that thing where I said, you know, we have no problem with sustained engagement because, because we, because it's just pouring at us in many ways. We've almost got too much and we can't handle all the different things that are possible. And so that was a core question of the hub. It wasn't something that I added on later to say, I need a leadership recruitment program. It's like, how does the hub, how does this platform become the place where you can achieve your wildest dreams and what you wanted in the world? It, and most importantly, when you're in this much proximity to London, because we're only an hour and 10 minutes away, how can it be like, how can you bring the best work to places like Birmingham rather than lose all your best leaders to your nesters and your big innovation agencies? So that's where it started from. So, and I didn't know how we were going to do this, but to say that early on, it was a core question. It's not something that's happened by accident. And um, if anybody wants to know about the other core questions that we asked ourselves, I've got those in another uh, presentation. I can talk um, aside from this. So from there, my constant exploration was around this so for example when amy started to talk about childcare, um she she was one of those brilliant people that you know absolutely didn't want to lose um and so we actually started to 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 the hub started to co-invest in her vision for future families and children and the future and build it into a program and build it into something in which she could she could really take that forward the same happened with demo dev um andy my co-founder some of you might know him he's quite well known um he he um was talking about data and housing and the housing crisis and so we started to develop demo dev with wiki house and open systems lab and and dark matter labs and so as as a sort of overarching leader of this organization when i saw brilliant people within my team starting to you know after after the first year when you fixed stopped fixing the printer well you never stopped fixing the printer but you know what i mean once the hub actually was working and we once i saw them starting to go okay well what, there must be more than coming into this space and running it operationally every day how do we make these big visions real um, and then I would actively invest in that space. So we actively invested to grow Demo Dev as a movement for data housing, small sites, community housing. Um, we actively started to invest in radical childcare as this movement for um, radically better outcomes for children and families. And the same when I started to see artists do that. So my um, kind of continued professional development for my team is to actually really help them to have resources and connections and for the hub platform to be a place that they can do that work and probably with the magic combination of the the platform and the uh, resource and team to do it without all the bureaucracy of having to go to like a nesta or a big organization where they lose all of that community and contextual incredible work that they get to do so um so this has been it's intentional it's not by accident i you know half of my energy and time is spent on looking at how you keep bringing those brilliant people up and you keep saying you know Birmingham is the place this we can do this together and you keep expanding people's opportunities and and vision for what what's possible awesome thank you so much Jimmy uh, our one hour is uh, about up 
hope the clock is uh, 12 already. Uh, would you maybe, Amy, want to say some final words? Um, I guess, yeah, I think we are taking all of this work a step forward now into the neighbourhood level. We're looking to to build something quite uh, bold and pretty exciting and I'm really happy to talk to anyone about that um, another time or, or jump onto a, a call about what our theory of change around that is again. Um, but I want to say that, that I strongly, strongly believe actually over the last couple of years that that we need to actually devolve and decentralize lots of this work. We need to make it cool again to not exit something as quick as we possibly can, but to actually take world-class resources, thinkers, doers into communities and build from the ground up because the opportunities out here are incredible. They're not crowded. They're not full of, you know, like, like your big cities. They're, they're open. People are excited. And this idea that it's only consultants and professionals that can engage in this complexity work is, is completely false. Um, actually, yes, you have to think about how you organize, what language you use, what are the tools you use. But people, people at the front line of living the hellish experiences that they are right now in poverty in neighborhoods really know how to engage in systems in systems thinking in imagining and all you all we need to be there for is nudge them to tools to information to framing about you know maybe existential threats and most crucially to help them to dream again that there can be something better than the the, the crap that we're in and i think that this is really linked back to what is actually happening in in across europe at the moment but in in england particularly you know people have lost hope they have lost this idea that you can that something better is ahead for all of us um and so i think that this work is really really crucial i urge you all to think about like where you are most uh, contextual and relevant and where your heart really is because if you take some of the talents and the work that you're doing at a, an institutional level and embed them somewhere or help to embed them somewhere I really think the satisfaction you can get from watching watching that sort of that shift in, in people, in communities, and how people come together is, is remarkable um, and I'm really really glad that I resisted you know, leaving here, because you can imagine in the work that we've done, there's tons of different sort of design agencies and governments and people who say, you know, you know, what will it be to buy out your whole team and bring you here and stuff. And we've resisted that. And we've let the people who should do that and do it well, like, for example, Dark Matter Labs and others who are based in London, do that. And, and we've stuck to it. It's been, been really glorious. Um, and so, yeah, it's an honour to share. And I'm, I'm grateful for you all listening. I hope something has been interesting. And if you need any resources, everything's open. We can share more and more with you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your inspirational words, Amy. And I really like what you were saying about systems thinking. It's not something, you know, really academic that has, it has been for a long time, but it's more and more about, you know, bringing perspectives together and, you know, doing that in a fun way and using a language that is that anybody basically can use. And yeah. We have that capability. Then we know how, how as a community we might, we might tackle these big issues that are wicked problems or or local problems or, or otherwise and maybe together create a better society. So yeah, absolutely. thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, thanks also everybody who, who participated in our uh, webinar today. Uh, it's been really, really awesome. Awesome to listen to Imi and her story and her practical practical work around this, this topic. So thank you everybody. Thank Let's you. See you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.